You're listening to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. Welcome to another episode of the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Hmm. Not the musical episode. I think there's some something with my connection there. There. Yeah. It sounded like there was some vibrato in your voice. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Not the musical episode that you've all been looking forward to, but just a little something, something to make you happy, keep you warm at night. How dare you? <laughs> uh, today we're uh, here with a regular episode. Not even a that gets my goat. Our first regular episode. That's true, yeah. The first Since the parting of the ways. First one since we had many car troubles. And we've got a story for you. It's uh, by an old-time favorite. Man has had probably six or seven stories on our, our show. Starting way back when, when we read one of his stories for Starship Sofa. And we liked it so much that we begged him to give us some for our own show. Uh, so yeah, Jason Sanford is here with a new story for us today. Uh, what's the title? His titles are always difficult to say. This one is, We Eat the Hearts of Those Who Come for You. <laughs> is that? I, yeah, I think you may actually have it. Did the, I get it? We Eat the Hearts That Come for You. Oh, so close. Just added a few extra words. Okay. We eat the hearts that come for you. So it's a story about werewolves, right? You wish. Ah. (laughs) It's much, much sadder than that. This this is a story he sent us a long time ago. And our friend and uh, glutton for punishment, Justin Charles, produced this for us. That's right. Yeah, this is a good long story for you to enjoy and uh yeah it it is of course some kind of very far future and it's unusual and i know that justin had a hard time coming up with sound effects for this story because you know things are just different (laughs) but he made it through and uh it didn't kill him which means it made him stronger so (laughs) thank you justin for that and, um, yeah, we're, we're just going to jump into the story. You've heard Jason on here a bunch of times. Is there anything we should say by way of introduction before moving on? Jason Sanford is a two-time finalist for the Nebula Award. Jason has published more than a dozen stories in the British SF magazine Interzone, which also devoted a special issue to his fiction. Not sure if it had a centerfold, though. He has also published numerous stories in magazines and anthologies such as Asimov Science Fiction, Analog, Intergalactic Medicine Show, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, and other places, including multiple years' best anthologies. His website, bjasonsanford.com. Jason Sanford also has uh, several short story collections that you can buy if you would like on Kindle or Nook or iBook or I don't know. Well, I'll put a I'll put a link to his page in the description so that you can get his stuff. Cause yeah, it's pretty darn cool. Um, I've always enjoyed his stories, and I would love if our listeners would support him by buying his stuff. That's always good. So anyways, go check that out if you can, but why don't you listen to this story first, and then check it out maybe after the episode's over. All right, without further ado, we eat the hearts that come for you. We do! The Hearts That Come For You by Jason Sanford 
The mountain and its monastery were Brother Marrow's ears, or so the monk always believed. The mountain curved like a natural amphitheater as it rose above the village of Antilly, each ridge and valley echoing the sounds below. When Brother Marrow tended to his monastic garden, his enhanced hearing delighted to the distant laughter of village kids. When he meditated over evening tea, the arguments of centuries-old friendships tickled around him. And on spring nights like this, the cyber-uploading cries and moans of amorous couples severely tempted his solitary vows. Or at least such sounds should be tempting him. But tonight, as Brother Marrow prepared to sleep in his monastic hut, he heard nothing but silence from below. Curious, he stepped outside the hut into the night forest. The dark trees around him stood whisper still, just like Antily itself. No roosters crowed or dogs barked, almost as if the animals' audio outputs had been overridden. But Brother Marrow knew the village heads would only do that in extreme emergencies. Disturbed, he decided to break his vows for a moment and extend his neural connection. He opened his connection, reached out to the village, and fell through perfect, total love. Brother Merrill gasped, oh. struggling to turn off his connection. He collapsed to the ground as the moonlight slicked the valley around him into a pearled glow broken only by the inked darkness of trees. He remembered a similarly enchanted night of his youth. A virtually enhanced moment from all those long centuries ago when he and Kendra walked through a moonlit forest of dreams. They'd held hands. They'd kissed. They'd hugged each other close. And then... With a pained scream, Brother Mero reached behind his neck and manually turned off his connection. The forest around him returned to reality as the painful memories receded to the back of his mind. As Brother Merrill lay panting on the ground, a strange aftertaste bubbled in his mouth. He tasted what almost felt like a kiss. A kiss of anger and love mixed to blood-cut iron and salt-given sand. The taste ran through his memories of that night with Kendra. He almost saw a face watching their private moment of love. Almost felt the face's anger. Almost... Almost. But then the face was gone, and he realized he'd been mistaken. There was no face. Merely the confusion which always came after having one's neural connection hacked. Not willing to risk opening his connection again, Brother Marrow increased his enhanced hearing to the maximum setting. The only sound daring to break the village's silence was low, painful keening. Bowing his head sadly, Brother Marrow stepped beside his tiny hut and lifted his brown robes from the clothesline. He wrapped their still damp fabric around his thin body and hurried down the path to the village. The village heads greeted him at the bottom of the mountain. I knew you'd come, said one of the Priya half. But my other disputed. She thought we must climb the path to tell you. The other Priya half rolled her eyes, but Brother Marrow's arrival had obviously confirmed the first half's words, so no further argument was voiced. Brother Marrow nodded politely, trying to avoid being caught up in the internal mix of love and bickering which characterized the Priyas. The two lived a mentally linked life, each providing half of their melded mind. The monk had known them for centuries. Sometimes they were village heads, sometimes not. Sometimes male, sometimes femme, sometimes both. What happened? Brother Marrow asked. My connection was briefly hacked. The Priyas nodded, unsurprised. Everyone, Everyone in the village felt the hacking's after effects. The Priyas said together, their mouths working as one. This wasn't an after effect, Brother Marrow said. Someone took control of my connection for a few moments. Really? The right Priya half asked, surprised. What did you experience? Brother Marrow shuddered as Kendra jumped to his mind, 
and iron and sand stung his mouth. He shook his head, not wanting to dwell on painful memories. Brother Merrill looked past the Priyas toward the village's homes, which sat on stilts over the moonlit floodplain like frozen trees grown from electric shimmering light. The keening he'd heard from the monastery was louder here, although he couldn't tell from which house the crying came. Is someone hurt? No. Someone is killed. Killed? Brother Marrow asked, shocked by the term. Deaths were infrequent enough, but in his several centuries at this monastery, he'd known no murders in the village, and only a single case in the surrounding villages. He looked again at the Priyas and noticed that their bodies were powered up, the relays under their dark skin ready to shock any attacker, their strong muscles and metal-sinked bones amped to rip meat from bone and sinew. As village heads, the Priyas were also its representatives of law. From their demeanor, it was obvious the murderer hadn't been caught. For a moment, fear washed through him. Then... With a single breath of air, Brother Merrow allowed the fear to leave his body. He hadn't spent so long being a monk as to let such base emotions rule him. When you capture the murderer, he said, bowing slightly to the Priyas and their powerful bodies, please show all possible restraint. Even murderers deserve mercy. The Priyas looked at each other in puzzlement as if not believing the information their enhanced brains transmitted between them. We were not clear, one Priya half finally said. There is no murderer, only a killer. When Brother Marrow didn't immediately understand, the Priyas fluttered their hands to both irritation and excess adrenaline. They looked beyond the monk toward the trees and the mountain above, obviously searching for the killer then walked on. Brother Marrow shook his head. Killer? Murderer? What difference did the term make? Deciding this was merely a disjointed verbal resonance arising from the Priya's joined brains, Brother Marrow bowed politely a final time to their receding forms, then walked toward the keening, balancing on the wooden planks the villagers used to walk from house to house when the floodwaters rose. As he walked through the village, he felt fear flowing from every house. Both the buzz of fear from people's neural connections and the scent of actual fear on their bodies. He found the source of the wailing in the middle of the village, within the house built by Elijah the Creative. Elijah lay dead on the floor of the home's main room, surrounded by her family and friends. Her life mate kneeled beside the body, a low subsonic keening rising from his closed mouth. Brother Marrow knew the song, a funeral dirge Elijah had crafted decades ago. She'd open-sourced the song to the world, where it had attained a good deal of acclaim. Elijah's life mate, a prominent sub-vocalist named Keela, nodded to the monk but didn't stop singing, his song deep echoing through Brother Marrow's body. Elijah and Keela's kids ran to the monk. He hugged them both as they cried and shook. Friends of the couple thanked the monk for coming. Brother Marrow sat cross-legged beside Keela, the kids holding tight to his robes. The room around him appeared bare. The simply slat walls painted a nondescript green, a few wooden chairs, a table, two glow lamps in the corners. However, Brother Marrow had visited Elijah and Keela a number of times and knew that wasn't how the people here saw this house. Elijah had once convinced him to briefly pause his order's vows and access the room's virtual templates. He remembered the bare room rioting into deep blues and maroons and the walls running to elaborate pictures and designs minecrafted by Elijah. For a moment... He was tempted to again access the template to ease the pain surrounding him. As he held the kids, he looked at Elijah's body. She lay on the floor's bare wood planks, lines of blood showing where someone, likely Keela or his friends, had dragged her here from outside the house. Her chest was ripped open, the heart missing. Whoever, 
or whatever, had ripped her heart out, had done so much damage the healers in Elijah's bio-human body couldn't repair her. Brother Marrow stared at the pool of blood beneath her body, which dripped through the cracks between the floor planks and pattered softly across the floodwaters below. He glanced at the kids in his arms and was relieved their neural connections accessed an altered view of the room's reality. For the briefest of moments, his interface reached out and accessed the kids' reality. He saw their mother looking calm and peaceful, sleeping happily, surrounded by smiling angels and carefree teddy bears and colorful balloons. Keela continued his dirge for hours, his kids eventually crying themselves to sleep in Brother Marrow's arms. The monk carried them to bed, then returned to the main room to find Keela pausing in his song. The friends who'd been here earlier had returned to their own homes, knowing Keela wasn't alone as long as Brother Marrow remained. Keela's connection buzzed to people from around the world, the crowds no doubt consoling the man and visiting virtuals of this room and sharing their own memories of Elijah's life. Keela stood on shaking legs as he disconnected. His eyes jumped slightly as the reality he'd been immersed in merged with the harshest possible reality. He stared down at his life mate and shook his head. I must clean her body, he said. And the room. And prepare for the funeral. I will join you, Brother Marrow said, pulling Keela into a hug. Keela cried and buried his face in the monk's robe. She loved another? Keela whispered. What do you mean? She died loving another. Keela stared at Brother Marrow's face and opened his neural connection, desperate for the monk to understand. The monk nodded and opened his own connection trying to remember the last time he'd broken his vows so many times in a single day. However, his order was also quite pragmatic. And in such situations, how could he not open himself to someone in need? Keela's mind connected with his. For a split moment, Brother Marrow felt the stomach-dropping sensation of reality shifting before entering Keela's mind. Except, he didn't see one of Keela's memories. Instead... He saw through Elijah's eyes. We were sharing a connection before she died. Keela whispered in Brother Marrow's mind, explaining. I was home, watching the kids, while she created. The memory showed Elijah on a walkway behind the village. The floodwaters only a hand span beneath the planks. The full moon spun the water around Elijah into a glow almost like walking through silver clouds. Elijah, creative as always, crafted this sensory input in real time so the reality she experienced became simultaneously the water, moon, and clouds. She'd so loved the creation that she began sharing it with Keela back home. Elijah reached the end of the walkway and stood on the riverbank, looking back with her creative eyes at the village. Suddenly, she heard a shuffling behind a nearby tree. Elijah turned as a person stepped from the tree. At this point, the memory shifted. Obviously, Elijah's mind had been hacked because Brother Marrow found it difficult to comprehend from her memories what the person looked like, let alone craft a description. The person appeared to be shorter than Elijah, but Brother Marrow could tell little beyond that. No professed gender... No shape or color or design to the person's face, hair, and skin. All he knew was that Elijah's emotions exploded at the sight of this person. Elijah literally staggered, kneeling onto the dirt of the riverbank. The person approached Elijah and laid a hand on her face. I love you, Elijah whispered. I truly do. A soft voice said, hush. I know you do, but there's only one way to prove it. I understand, Elijah said, love pulsing her mind. Will you take my heart? Please, take it. The ghostly person nodded sadly and reached for Elijah's chest. 
There was no pain as Elijah's chest ripped open in an explosion of blood, and the person yanked her heart free. Elijah fell back and stared up, still feeling the rush of love as the person raised her heart to mouth and began to eat. As death grabbed her, Elijah thought four simple words. Forgive me, my love. Brother Marrow snapped back to his own mind, taking care to completely shut down his neural connection. He looked anew at Elijah's torn open body. You see? Keela gasped. She loved another. He fell to his knees and ran his fingers over Elijah's cheek. She was forced to love another. The memory clearly shows her neural connection being hacked. Everyone in the village felt the aftertaste of the hacking. Keela nodded, but didn't agree. Brother Marrow knew the Priyas had likely said the same thing when they'd examined his memory. Knowing Keela needed time to grieve, but also knowing how easily grief could turn to bitterness, as one wallowed in the looping pains of memory, Brother Marrow thought back to his ordination. As the other monks had chanted, Marrow's abbot had described the different forms of illusion. False sight, false hearing, false understanding before asking Marrow to stand before her to receive proof of what life could do if one was unprepared. The abbot had mentally reached out, caressing Marrow's neural connection with her own and traipsing through his memories. Suddenly, Marrow saw himself as a young man walking hand in hand with his sibling friend Kendra through the forest around their village, the moonlit night pouring milk and life to their every step. They connected their minds and experienced love through each other's senses. They watched the river beside their village as it rose from weeks of rains. But instead of being worried, all they saw were reflections of purest beauty. Suddenly, Marrow tasted iron and sand, and the sensation that they were being observed. Kendra looked at him in puzzlement. She tasted the same. But they shrugged it off as a quirk of their connected love. They returned home and fell asleep, only to be awoken by screaming neural alarms, which warned of the collapse of an ancient dam upriver. They barely had time to run for the door before the house collapsed around them. They hung on to a single remaining pillar as the rushing waters gulped around them. Don't worry! Marrow screamed as their grip weakened. We can't die! We'll heal! We'll come back! When Mero relived that memory during his ordination, he knew he was wrong. So as Kendra lost her grip, he jumped for her. In his relived memories, not in the long-ago truth of his past. No longer trusting the nano-healers in their bodies or the realities created day and night by their neural connections. But as Mero leaped for Kendra, the abbot released her hack. The flood disappeared, and the monastery reappeared. Mero crashed onto the floor. What is reality when we are reality? The abbot stated solemnly. Never forget that. Brother Mero shivered at the memory and the taste of iron and sand in his mouth as Keela looked at him expectantly. When I was ordained... He whispered to Keela, having never spoken to anyone about the pain of his ordination. My neural connection was hacked. Deliberately. It's part of becoming a monk. To see how easily what you think of is life, what you see and hear, taste, touch and smell, can be manipulated into something impure. Keela's face ran to horror. I'd heard rumors... The monks did that. Not that you can trust all you hear or experience while connected. It's true. Now, my hacking was different from Elijah's. I gave permission. She did not. Still, I was as overwhelmed as she was. I couldn't stop the manipulation of my senses and mind, just as she couldn't stop loving the person who killed her. And that makes her resistance all the more powerful. 
Keela looked to Brother Mara with hope in his eyes, desperate for anything to latch on to. The monk smiled. Your life mate fought hard to ask your forgiveness. For Elijah to still think of you while she was being hacked. I couldn't have done that. But she did. Keela nodded and collapsed onto Elijah's body, sobs racking his thin frame. Brother Marrow held the man through the rest of the night, praying that this final breaking of his vows, lying, wouldn't be held against him. Because he knew the truth, no one could stop a hack as deep as the one Elijah experienced. No, Elijah hadn't been asking Keela's forgiveness. She'd been asking her new love to forgive her for dying. Brother Merrill briefly wondered what type of creature could so completely overwhelm someone's sense of self as to be invited to kill them. He then pushed the thought from his mind as he focused on his duty to the living. Brother Merrill stayed in the village of Antilly for the next week. He tended to Keela and his kids, prepared Elijah's body for the funeral, led the ceremony and ministered to fearful people who wondered if they might be the next to die. That last took the heaviest toll on Brother Marrow. Even though the Priyas continually patrolled the village, they'd yet to find the killer. Drones and flitters were even sent from across the land, but the killer, murderer, Brother Marrow knew, refusing to accept that Elijah requesting her own death made this any less a crime, wasn't found. And for once, the villagers truly appreciated him being there. During his previous trips to the village, he'd often been treated as a relic, as the man who refused access to the virtual. While Antily was a poor village, the people here were proud, with many holding virtual jobs and careers around the world, and a few, like Elijah, even receiving acclaim for their work. But as Brother Marrow knew, nothing ripped away the void beneath the virtual like death. So he talked with people, helped them with their chores, tried his best to show that even when reality was at its worst, life went on. Finally, on a night exactly seven days after Elijah's murder, Brother Merrill began the climb back to his monastery. He was halfway up the mountain when he spotted a young woman waiting beside the path, sitting on a moss-coated stone. The woman was thin, like Brother Merrow, and grinned as if greeting an old friend. And she was. The girl was long-dead Kendra, his sibling friend washed away hundreds of years ago in that flood. Brother Merrow paused and carefully checked his neural connection. It appeared inactive. He wasn't being hacked or manipulated, or at least not that he could detect. Are you the one who murdered Elijah? He asked softly. How could I murder someone who asked me to kill them? Kendra said, her voice sounding exactly like Kendra's. Brother Merrill remembered his sibling friend being washed away from him and tried to calm his anger at this fraud. You hacked Elijah, he said, his hands shaking from wanting to punch this evil creature. He paused, took a breath, and released the emotion. She had a family, young kids. Do you even care what you did to them? To Brother Marrow's surprise, Kendra, and she might as well have been Kendra for how he saw and reacted to her, bowed her head as if in penance. I tried. She said, I always try to not have them ask to be killed. Brother Merrow looked at Kendra and, to his surprise, believed her. Still, this didn't change his duty. He turned to descend the path back to the village. Where are you going? Kendra asked, using the same tone as Brother Merrow's long-ago sibling friend, when she knew the answer before asking a question. I will inform the Priyas that you are here. If you are truly sorry... You will let them take you into custody. I can't allow that, 
It goes against my programming. Brother Marrow had worried that might be the case. While this Kendra looked biohuman, she was likely highly mechanical. That would explain the ease with which she'd both changed her body to resemble Kendra and hacked into Elijah's mind. And if someone took the time and expense of creating such a biomechanical wonder, they likely wouldn't allow her to be easily caught or destroyed. I have no choice, Kendra said. Every few months, the pressure builds in my programming, and I must connect with someone, make them fall in love with me. If you report me to the Priyas, I'll simply vanish, and one day soon, someone else will ask me to kill them. And if I don't tell the Priyas? I'll stay here, and when the time comes... I'll connect with you. You'll then ask me to kill you, and I'll do it. Brother Marrow understood. If she killed him, it meant she wouldn't be killing some random innocent, at least this time. If he tried to turn her in, he'd live. But someone's death months later would be on his soul. There was no question where his duty lay. The monastery is beautiful at night. He said, as he pointed up the path. If you follow me, I'll show you. Brother Marrow gave her an empty meditation hut to sleep in, then walked to his own hut, where he fell into an exhausted sleep. He dreamed that the last week was merely a fevered hack forced into his mind by his abbot, that everything he'd experienced for the last three hundred years, everything since becoming a monk, was merely an extended hack from his ordination ceremony. But in the morning, when he walked into the monastery's meditation hall, there sat Kendra, meditating cross-legged on the wood plank floor. He knew then the reality he was experiencing would never approach anything but truth. Any chance you'll turn yourself in today? He asked as he sat beside her. It's rude to intrude on someone's meditation. It's beyond rude to murder someone. Kendra nodded and turned to face him. You're angry. Not very monkish of you. Why do you look like Kendra? My neural connection is off, so I know you're not hacking me. But you still look like her. Perhaps I hacked you days ago, and the hack is still running. As Brother Marrow's anger rose... Kendra smiled as if joking. She ran her fingers through her shoulder-length black hair, obviously pleased by the novelty of the sensation. Calm down, Marrow. You opened your connection to Keela during the wake for Elijah, and I accessed your memories then. The rest... She said, waving her hands up and down her Kendra body. Is a dictate of my programmed need to manipulate you. This shocked Brother Marrow. Why would she have dared approach Elijah's wake when the Priyas were searching for her? As if knowing Brother Marrow's question, Kendra bowed her head. I was mourning for Elijah. I loved her. I truly did. Seeing that Brother Marrow didn't comprehend, Kendra gestured for him to open his neural connection. When the monk hesitated, Kendra laughed. I could force your connection open, but if you don't want to understand... Shaking his head at how easily he could be manipulated, Brother Merrill opened his neural connection. He suddenly saw Kendra's life, and to him that was truly who she was. Kendra. Every time she assumed a new mimicry of a life, she became that life her memory reshaping itself so she was Kendra, had always been Kendra and ever would be Kendra. But she'd also been created as something else. Brother Merrow saw a famous man he dimly remembered from the days before he'd disconnected from virtual life. The man was powerful and rich and had obsessed on being killed by his true love. To feel nothing but love as his heart was ripped from his body and eaten. To die knowing nothing but the passion of what he called the ultimate surrender. 
So he created Kendra, and she changed herself to a body chosen from the man's memory and hacked his connection. He fell in perfect love with her before asking, asking ever so gently, for her to rip his heart out. But the man made a mistake. Once he was dead, Kendra couldn't stop following her programming. She sought out new connections, made each fall in absolute love with her, a love which could only be satisfied when the other person opened themselves to a perfectly loving death. Do you see? Kendra asked as Brother Marrow came back to himself. I love each of you as intensely as I can. My creator wanted me to experience the same love I created in him. So, after I killed Elijah, I mourned for her and hid beneath her house in the floodwaters, desperate to still be near her. And that's where I learned of your long-ago love for Kendra. Brother Marrow shivered, trying not to imagine how many people had been killed because of her foolish creator's selfish desires. And that didn't even account for the pain the man had crafted into this construct's life through her perverse programming. Then Brother Marrow remembered the taste of iron and sand. I felt someone hack my connection before... I walked to the village. That was me. When I overwhelm someone's connection, there's feedback on all the connections in the nearby vicinity. No, that's how the Priyas described it. But this was different. This hack took control of my connection, and I'd tasted it before. Brother Marrow stopped, unsure how to describe the sensation he'd felt of the angry face watching him and Kendra before she died. Kendra looked at him as if unable to respond. Not knowing what else to say, Brother Marrow stood up. If you're staying at the monastery, you'll have to work. Which do you prefer, to weed the gardens or unclog the sewage recycling tank? Kendra shrugged. I'm only staying until I kill you, so you choose. Septic tank it is, Brother Marrow said with a nervous grin. And so, for the next few months, Kendra lived, at least in Brother Marrow's heart. The two of them lived and worked side by side, tending the monastery gardens, maintaining the buildings, and meditating on the truths inside reality and illusion. They spoke very little, But that was actually how Brother Merrill remembered his life with Kendra all those centuries ago, where days would pass without them needing to speak, so well did they know each other. For Brother Merrill, the irony of this was almost beyond comprehension. He'd joined the monkhood because he couldn't stand living in a world so tied to the virtual, a world where he could spin memories of his dead love into a copy of Kendra and live as if she'd never die. That world had bubbled all around him, and still did, begging only a quick neural connection to access. He'd forsaken those illusory temptations to recreate Kendra, only to have the same temptation arrive in the form of this artificial construct. Why did she die? Kendra asked one day as they were repairing the past stepping stones after a strong rain washed them askew. An ancient dam broke. No one ever determined exactly why, although the river was at flood stage from heavy rains. But the fault also lies with Kendra and myself. We were young and arrogant. We thought ourselves truly immortal, that our healers would revive us from anything. But they don't. When she died, it was like my heart had been ripped out. After Brother Marrow said this last part, he froze. He hadn't intended to mention what Kendra did to people. He was merely being honest. But if Kendra was hurt by his poor choice of words, she didn't show it. Instead, she seemed sad, as if truly pained by Brother Marrow's loss. Sometimes... I could kill myself, she said softly. 
But every time I try, my programming stops me. I think my creator was afraid I'd commit suicide before I killed him. He was a selfish man. I know, but I still loved him. Brother Marrow sighed, trying to remain detached from this copy of Kendra, but also finding himself drawn to her. He'd been tempted a few times to open his connection and contact the Priyas, or his distant abbot, and alert them to Kendra. But each time he'd been about to do so, Kendra had appeared at his side, looking hurt and angry as if she knew his plans. I'll disappear, she'd simply say. A single warning, and I'm gone. Unspoken was that her next killing would be on his conscience. He'd even tried trapping Kendra, locking her in a storage shed behind the temple. The shed was strong, built of reinforced stones and metals, having stood there for the last 2,000 years. And he'd planned to summon the Priyas to capture Kendra. But before he could open his connection to call, Kendra knocked down the shed side wall and stood there staring at it, her incredibly strong body twitching. For a moment, she'd looked alien, like the mix of human and machine she was, before her body flowed back to Kendra's familiar face. After that, Brother Marrow gave up trying to stop her. I like this. Kendra said as they finished leveling the final stepping stone. It's satisfying, doing work like this. You get to see what you accomplish. There's reality for you. Brother Marrow had intended to continue talking, or perhaps preach on the differences between reality and the virtual, and the similarities, too. But instead, as he watched Kendra tap the stone down with her foot, He realized he enjoyed simply being near her when she was happy. He glanced up the path, his enhanced eyes picking up each highlight and flicker on the dappled green trees around them. He heard faint laughter and increased his hearing until he could hear clearly the sounds of children playing in the village below. Reality, huh? Kendra said, smiling as she joined Brother Marrow and looking around. I don't see much difference between a beautiful day experienced by your enhanced senses and a virtually reimagined day clicking through your neural connection or a memory of a beautiful day. If they all make you happy, what does it matter? Brother Marrow paused, trying to collect his thoughts, trying to remember the lessons he'd taught on that very subject. But as he stood by Kendra... As for the hundredth time, he nearly forgot this wasn't his long-dead friend, but instead a simulacrum crafted from his memories. He couldn't find any response. I thought not, Kendra said, before laughing and jumping up and down on the stepping stone to push it smoothly into the dirt. A few weeks later, Brother Marrow and Kendra were pulling weeds in the monastery's vegetable garden when he heard someone walking up the path. He glanced over in time to see two femmes waving at him with synchronized movements of their hands. The Priyas. Both halves. He thought Kendra would run, but instead she bowed slightly to the village heads when they reached the garden. And you are... The right Priya half asked. I'm Kendra, an old friend of Brother Marrow's. Brother Marrow opened his mouth to tell the truth, but he saw Kendra's arm twitch, and he knew the construct would rip the Priyas apart if need be. He then waited for the Priyas to search the virtual and learn the truth. But instead, the Priyas relaxed and smiled in friendship, as if whatever they'd accessed had confirmed Kendra to be who she pretended to be. He should have known Kendra would be prepared for people who attempted to research her life. Brother Marrow is a good person, the left Priya half said. Of all the monks who've stayed here, he's our favorite. Mine too, Kendra said. Have you caught the killer? Brother Marrow asked, tired of the layers of illusion and pretense swirling around him. No, that's actually why we're here. The right Priya said. 
Brother Marrow's heart jumped, hoping they'd figured out the truth. But instead, the right Priya reached into her pants pocket and removed a small disc the size of her fingernail. We are distributing these to everyone in the area. Pulling back her hair, the Priya half showed where she'd placed a similar disc on her skin just under her right ear, directly over her neural connection. If the disc senses you are being hacked, it surges electricity into the connection. It'll knock you out instantly. Kendra looked closely at the disc. What if the attacker simply waits until we wake up? The left Priya half laughed, <laughs> causing the right Priya half to blush a deep red. Ah, yes, she said. I pointed that out to our superiors, but they said this is better than nothing. The Priyas placed a disc in Brother Marrow's hand, and one in Kendra's, before starting back down the path. Kendra examined her disc closely before giving it to Brother Marrow. It won't stop me she transmitted to Brother Marrow's neural connection, having forced it open so the Priyas couldn't hear her. People have tried this before. As I said, I'll simply wait until they awaken. As Kendra said this, Brother Marrow looked into her face and realized how beautiful she was. How she called to him. How she begged him to embrace her. Brother Marrow took a step toward her before stopping himself. The time grows near, Kendra said. My programming is demanding I fall in love again. I'm sorry. Brother Marrow nodded sadly as he glanced down the mountain at the Priya's receding forms, part of him desperate to yell for help. His enhanced eyes telescoped the Priya's until they appeared to again stand before him while his enhanced ears picked up their footfalls as they walked down the path. But no matter how he enhanced this reality, the Priyas still didn't understand what had truly happened here. I like those Priyas, Kendra said. They obviously love each other quite deeply. They can't help but love each other, living as they do. Even as the words came out of his mouth, Brother Marrow realized what he was saying. Kendra nodded. You're not only a good person, but insightful, too, she said. I like such qualities in those I fall in love with. Brother Marrow tapped his foot on a weed and ground it into the garden's soil. He wondered if the next monk to live here would take such care of the monastery. Because he knew, one way or another, at least for him, all this would soon be over. That night, Brother Marrow sat on the ground outside his hut, unable to sleep, but likewise unable to meditate. He stared at the two tiny discs in his hand. He'd already broken his vows, yet again, by opening his connection and accessing the disc's programming. Now, as he lay on his back, he clicked the discs one against the other, over and over. A soft knock on a tree nearby startled him. He looked over to see Kendra standing behind him. This is the last night, she said. I'm certain of it. Tomorrow, I won't be able to hold back my programming. Brother Marrow nodded. He could barely imagine how powerful her full programming would be. Even now, before her peak, Kendra looked so beautiful, just as she did in his most intimate of memories. You do understand, I'm not her, Kendra said. I'm only your memories of her. While you may have connected many times with her mind, she was still she. And you are no longer the you of all those centuries ago. That's why I never recreated a virtual version of Kendra. It wouldn't have been the same. Kendra nodded, pleased by his answer. She stepped closer, standing only a hand's touch away. I'm not Kendra. While my programming makes me mimic her, all the other lives I've copied also swirl in me, and there's even a touch of myself somewhere in here. Brother Marrow's body shook as he spoke. Last time Kendra and I embraced, 
not the embrace of fighting to survive in the flood, but a true embrace. It was a few hours before she died, when we were in a forest near our village. Kendra nodded. Brother Marrow knew she'd already touched this memory in his mind, but she was kind enough to still act as if all he said was unknown to her. That memory is perfect, he continued. We enhanced our reality until the moon bled milk light throughout the forest, and the wind chilled just enough to encourage us to hug each other tight. Our minds linked as we dipped our senses through nothing but absolute love. I treasure the memory because, a few hours later, it was all I had left. But... Kendra asked softly. But I can't let it go. Something haunts me from that night. A taste I can barely describe. A feeling that we were being watched. I sometimes wonder if our love that night truly happened. Or if it was all someone's hack. Perhaps even a hack I made. Maybe I was so desperate to fall in love that I crafted these memories from the virtual world around me. Kendra sat down beside Brother Marrow. Your memories are true. I know you truly loved me. We truly experienced that time together. Brother Marrow shivered at how easily Kendra embraced a life she'd never lived, and memories she'd never experienced. But he didn't care. How do you know? I've hacked enough minds to know when someone is being hacked. No... Our love truly happened. Thank you, he said. But I still can't. (laughs) Brother Marrow began to cry. Kendra reached around him, hugging him close and letting him cry until the tears stopped. He again tasted bloody iron and salt-given sand. The same as on that long-ago night. But where before the taste had always stormed to painful memories of that dam breaking and Kendra's death... This time, he felt absolved, as if the memories which had slammed his mind for so many centuries were being washed away, like the floodwaters from his long-ago village. If this was a hack, it was the most blissfully perfect one he'd ever experienced. Thank you, he repeated. Kendra smiled as she leaned over and kissed him her strong arms drawing him to her. Brother Marrow shivered again, but this time in happiness, as they lay back on the ground beside his hut, and the night pretended it didn't need to be enhanced at all. In the morning, Brother Marrow stood up quietly, taking care not to wake Kendra as he wrapped his leaf-covered robes around his naked body. He looked at Kendra as she twitched in her sleep. His neural connection buzzed slightly. He could literally taste her dreams. She was running, chasing after phantoms, which her programming always dangled just out of reach. He knew once she woke, the slight buzz he felt in his connection would immediately change as her program demand for love kicked in. Brother Merrill reached into his robe's pocket and felt the two discs the Priyas had given him. Even though he'd reprogrammed them last night, he still hesitated to take the next step. While he was far more biohuman than Kendra, many parts of him were still machine. He was reasonably sure his enhanced eyes and ears, and the healers which gave him such long life, would survive what he planned, but he wasn't positive. Not that any of those enhancements had helped him all these years as he'd fought to overcome his memories. But Kendra, she had helped him. Maybe he could return the favor. He knelt beside Kendra, who was still lost in her dreams. He placed both of the Priya's discs over his neural connection, then reached out and nudged her awake. Kendra opened her eyes to see him smiling. Her eyes twitched, and she looked at him as if they'd never truly seen one another. Kendra smiled back, a look of purest love radiating from her face, 
as her connection slammed into Brother Marrow's. As she reached into him and promised love, nothing but love for all time. Brother Marrow barely had time to feel himself falling toward that love before the Priya's disc shocked him unconscious. Brother Marrow woke hard, his eyes fuzzy, his ears ringing. He felt the sun warming his face, but couldn't see the sun. Where before he'd always heard every whisper and cry from the village, now he heard only the weak susurrus of the wind blowing. Except it wasn't the wind. The sound was a scream, a weak scream which built in intensity as his enhanced hearing returned. He heard a loud snapping like a tree breaking, followed by more snaps, and a crash as of a small building collapsing upon itself. And then silence. Footsteps. The hot breath of someone growling in his ears. Lips almost touching his skin. Strong arms snatched him painfully up and gripped him breakbone tight. Marrow! A sharp voice asked. I know you're awake. Brother Marrow shook his head, trying to see through the haze around him. The world was no longer crisp and clear. Something burned on his neck. He reached back and touched the discs and remembered. The Priya's discs were only supposed to shock him unconscious when Kendra accessed his neural connection. But he'd increased their power and placed two discs there. The discs, he said. They destroyed your connection and damaged your enhanced eyes and ears. The healers are even now repairing you, but your neural connection is beyond help. Brother Marrow was able to see a little better. As the healers repaired his eyes, a face hovered before his. Kendra. Behind her, Brother Marrow saw his meditation hut in ruins. The trees around the hut were also broken, snapped like dry twigs under a child's angry hands. Do you know what you've done? Kendra asked. I've stopped you. With my connection burned out, you can't overwhelm me. You can't make me ask to be killed. Kendra screamed and dropped Brother Marrow on the ground as she ran to a nearby tree. She punched the tree, snapping it in half the top part crashing to the ground in a burst of leaves and dust. Kendra kicked the fallen tree and screamed again, grabbing her head as if in pain. She stomped back to Brother Marrow and pulled him up to face her. Say it, she demanded. Say it! Say what? Your heart! Ask me to rip out your heart and eat it! No. Kendra screamed again as she collapsed to the ground, taking Brother Marrow with her. Fear ran through his body. He tried to breathe deep, to release the fear, but couldn't. I freed you, he whispered. Without my connection, your programming can't make me ask to be killed. As Brother Marrow said this, he gazed at Kendra's face. He could see the love in her eyes just like the eyes of his own Kendra before she died. For a moment, he imagined their life together, imagined the last few months stretching into years and decades, Kendra once again loving him, and the love he'd begun to feel for this copy would continue. But he wouldn't be so overwhelmed that he'd ask her to kill him. And as long as he didn't ask to be killed, she wouldn't be free to kill anyone else. Her programming would be stuck in a loop, unable to fulfill the one thing she'd been built to fulfill. Brother Marrow knew his abbot and fellow monks wouldn't approve of what he'd done, how he'd used love to trap this construct. But what other choice did he have? As he looked at Kendra, he saw her calming down and reflecting on life. He whispered to her of what they could have together. How this was her chance to experience true love, not the illusion crafted by her programming. I think I'd like that, Kendra said, cradling his body with her leg and right arm, as her left hand gently rested on his chest. 
But would our love be real? Do you really love me? Brother Marrow nodded gently. Kendra's body shook, and a tear ran down her cheek. She seemed happy, truly happy, if only for a moment. Then pain shivered her face and she looked away. When she looked back at Brother Marrow, her hands shook. I... I have to tell you something, she said. You won't love me after I tell you. Nothing will change what I feel. Kendra leaned over, her lips beside his ear. Iron and sand, she said. Now that your neural connection is gone, the hack I placed there is also gone. Brother Merrow looked puzzled for a moment. Then the taste of blood-cut iron and salt-given sand flooded his mouth. He remembered his last night with Kendra, remembered the feeling that someone had been watching, that an angry face was nearby observing their love. And a face had been there. This construct, this now version of Kendra. I'd been nearby... Kendra said. I'd just killed another person who loved me. And as I passed through that forest, despairing at the death of yet another of my loves, I saw you and Kendra kissing. For no particular reason, programmed instinct perhaps, I reached out and tasted your emotions, saw the love you had, and I wanted to die. Because right then, I knew I'd never experience anything close to what you two felt. Brother Marrow tried to push himself away from this Kendra. He didn't want to hear more, but she held him tight. I hacked your minds so you wouldn't remember me. But I couldn't let go of what I'd felt. I couldn't forget. I followed both of you. Watched you enter your house. And when I realized I'd never have any of this, I exploded with anger. I ran upriver to where that ancient dam lay, powered up my body... And I hit it, over and over, wanting you two to die. And when the dam broke, Kendra did die, but not you. For some reason, you didn't. Brother Merrill pushed his hand against Kendra's face, but he couldn't break free of her grasp. I'm sorry, Merrill, Kendra said. I truly am. Back then... I was new to my life. I couldn't control my anger. But I'm different now. When I killed Elijah in the village and learned you were nearby, I reactivated the hack in your neural connection. I thought I'd simply see how you were doing. But as we spent time together... Brother Merrill understood. She'd actually fallen in love with him. Not as her programming demanded, but instead truly in love. I can't, Brother Mero began. Please, she said. I told you before, there's no difference between the real, the virtual, or memories. If you're happy, you're happy. If you're in love, you're in love. Brother Mero nodded and smiled, agreeing with her logic. He held her hand and laid it against his chest. I love you, he said, staring at her face, at the trees above him, his enhanced eyes and ears again working, the sun flittering among the trees Kendra hadn't knocked down, the laughter of kids and families in the village caressing his hearing. Not because you're my Kendra, you're not, but because of who you are, because of the time we've spent together. Thank you. Kendra smiled as Brother Marrow squeezed her hand 
and tapped it twice against his chest. But I can't forget, he said. I won't allow it. I'm sorry. Before Kendra could react, Brother Merrill asked her to take his heart. Kendra screamed, begging her programming not to do what it demanded. She fought her hand as it released Brother Merrow's, as it tapped, tapped, tapped on the skin and bones covering his heart. Goodbye, Kendra, Brother Merrow said, as her hand ripped into his chest without his neural connection to numb the pain. But the pain didn't matter. None of it did. Because he loved Kendra. He truly, truly did. Happy Valentine's Day, kids. <laughs> yeah, I was sad that, that we didn't get to run that on Valentine's Day Yeah, that in 2016. That would have been really good Valentine's story for you, Ben. All, all, you know, that was your thing. I mean, we even had special un-Valentine's Day uh, episodes. Don't remind me. Oh, this <laughs> no. We eat the hearts that come for you was originally published in the anthology Bless Your Mechanical Heart, edited by Jennifer Brozek. The title to the story came to me first, one of those phrases which sticks in an author's mind and refuses to let go until you write a story to fit it. The setting is a mix of the rural countryside I grew up in and the village I lived in in Thailand while a Peace Corps volunteer. I'm really pleased with this story and, of all the ones I've written... It's likely my favorite. So, um, yeah, the, I, I did notice, I, I didn't know that Justin had had a hard time with the sound effects, but I did notice the sound effects in this one, particularly the sound effect there at the end. <laughs> Lovely eating of the heart. <laughs> the Valentine's Day sound effect. Yeah, I think he, he uh, outdid himself on this thing. And um, I can't say that I'm envious of the job he had at hand. I, I believe that was one of my episodes and we gave it to Justin and hence people are actually hearing it. <laughs> yeah, after it was done, he was like, yeah, maybe next time one that's a little shorter, huh? And I thought, okay, well, we've got this space opera story <laughs> that, oh. The cat's eating it. That might be twice as long. I can't remember, but uh, <laughs> I think we're going to give Justin a rest so he doesn't kill himself before uh, we can squeeze more work does, out of him. Does Justin have uh, a uh, website? I don't think so. I was going to say, maybe there's somebody out there that Is, would want Justin to uh, produce their audiobook for money or something, which would be a nice way to mm. pay it forward for all the uh, work he's done for us. If you are listening and you have an audiobook that you want Justin to uh, produce, drop us a line and we will uh, get you guys connected. Because Justin deserves it. Well, let's uh, acknowledge the other voice. I mean, it was just you and me and then uh, Renee Chambliss. Yeah, Renee Chambliss was here classing the place up. Making it not smell as bad as it normally does when it's just us. I don't know how we lucked into becoming friends with Renee, but we really did luck out when we did. Because, yeah, just hearing her voice and any of our stuff, it just elevates it so much. I remember when she did our first story that uh, Brian Lincoln got her to do for us. Anyways, it was super amazing. Like, I heard her voice and I was like, holy crap. 
Oh, wow. This person sounds like a professional. <laughs> the recording is just beautiful. Wow. This makes our show seem so much more classy than it is. Yeah, luckily we've managed to, you know, get her to come back again and again and again and become friends with her. And, oh, it's been so worth it because, yeah, every time she shows up, it's like, it's like there's a bunch of dudes sitting around in a room together and they're like farting. And then a girl shows up and has perfume on and all of a sudden it doesn't smell so bad. It's like that. You know what I mean? Oh, I've been in a room with you. I know exactly what you're referring to. <laughs> oh. One thing I find interesting about Jason Sanford's stories is that they're set in super far off future. I, I think back in the old days when sci-fi originally started up and you had people like Asimov and the like writing your sci-fi, it was pretty much, you know, regular life but on Moon or on Mars or Saturn or whatever. Everybody was pretty regular. They were all just scientists. They liked to talk about science. You didn't have... Things like Priyas or neural connections and people that lived hundreds of years and experienced things together with other people and monks that took vows of not connecting their neural net because that was the version of, I don't know, going without food, fasting or something. And each time we get a story from Jason, it's, it's something like that, something really far into the future. And I, I find it really interesting because my mind doesn't work that way, usually. Like if I was to try and come up with a far future story, it would probably be just dudes like me in a spaceship flying around and, I don't know, blowing up TIE fighters or something. <laughs> And so, yeah, just the kind of thing where, you know, you have the Priyas who are connected by their brains and their living lives where sometimes they're females and sometimes they're males and sometimes they're et cetera, et cetera. Just the kind of things that people envision in the future. And I, I don't know, I guess that's kind of a trend in sci-fi in general. You know, there's a lot, there's, Jason Sanford isn't the only author that does the the far future stories that are so different that, you know, there was, Anne, I think it was Anne Leckie's story where the character just had to be, they had, she used a different, uh, what is it? Pronoun. Yeah, the pronoun where it, it wasn't he, she, I want to say it was Z and Zer or something like that. I can't remember. Of course, that's a thing that's already starting. I mean, there's lots of people that have preferred pronouns they want you to use. So I guess it's a thing that you could see coming uh, from here, possibly, if you just take things the way they are and spin them out into the future and think, what would it be like if this progressed? Well, yes, but there are, I mean, you've read more science fiction than I have, but I've read a lot of Ray Bradbury, and you can always feel when he wrote it in the 40s or the 50s or he wrote it in the 60s, no matter when it's set, if it's set in the year 3000, people still talk and act as though it's the 50s. And, right. And, but I don't think that that means it's a bad kind of science fiction. I mean, is there anything that's going to be dated about this story 100 years from now or 50 years from now where you'll read it and say, oh, this was written in the 20 teens? Oh, I'm sure... I'm sure there's lots of things that are that way where they like, oh yeah, they were all thinking that this was what was going to happen. So many stories about that kind of stuff in this time or whatever. I, you know, I know that Jason Sanford himself reads a lot. He did a whole story that we ran called Book Scouts of the Galactic Rim. That was kind of an homage to all the, the stuff that he's read over the years. And... Um, how it shaped him and molded him. So he'd probably <laughs> be able to tell us best. If only we had him here, we should Skype him. Do you think we could get him on the line? Probably not. Oh, I don't know. I imagine he's a real writer. He's probably busy. Yeah. 
he's working. He's he, he'd be like, "What? Uh oh, call from Doonstief? Voice mail." Okay, back to the story. But yeah, I, I'm sure there are lots of things that are trends that uh, you could even look back to stories from the '80s and the '90s and the O's and be able to say, "Oh yeah, this is written from that time." Because that is what was going on then. It's a story that takes place in 2100 and you wait for the modem to make the connection to get online. <laughs> right. It's funny like that. I mean, I, I wrote a story and I was thinking about putting it on the Doonstief and I went back and looked through it. And I had written it before Facebook had existed. Okay. And so the guy is trying to look up his old high school friend and he like gets on the school's website and like tries to find their list of alumni. That it was just like, I'm reading that and going, what the crap? If I'm gonna try and publish this, I gotta change that. <laughs> Cause that's not going anywhere anymore. But is yeah, that a story just... that we did run on the show? No, it was my revenge crystal story. It still sits. But um, it was... Well, uh, we were going to run... Sorry to interrupt you, man. We were going to run my story Library Week. Mm -hmm. And at the very beginning of that story, he takes the family to the video store. <laughs> go, uh, I don't like to go to Hollywood Video because they always greet you when you walk in the door. And, stuff. and I, I was just like, wow, that's so insanely dated... But I thought, well, it would be a fun conversation to have about it. Yeah. You know, and I wasn't going to update that story so it no longer referred to video stores, but use yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, as... things can be written for the time that they took place in. If you published it now, you could just say, yes, I wrote this story. Uh, it's set in this time. <laughs> It's like you write a story set in the 80s, and so you put things that happened in the 80s. Of course, the story that you wrote where there's a video store is going to be much more accurate because it was actually written at that time, so you hadn't forgotten about a lot of the things that uh, took place. There won't be any anachronisms. Yeah, I... You won't accidentally have them having iPhones before they were invented or something. Just yesterday I was reading a, a Stephen King story and it took place in 1974 it was october of 1974 and uh, the teacher is talking about president nixon and and i was just like well, nixon wasn't president in 74 i had to look it up because i was just like no there's no way and yeah I, nixon was long gone by october 74 uh -huh. i thought that that was strange because it's not like he's somebody my age i mean he was alive in that time he would remember Nixon's resignation. It's just strange that there would be an error like huh. that in there. So it was written recently and was looking back. Yeah, at it was written time. in 2017. Hmm. Yeah, see, I was re reading his book Dreamcatcher. Okay. And that book was written, I think, in the year 2000. It was written after the Bush versus Gore election, right? Okay. The thing that I thought was interesting was, you know, at the end of the story, he talks about the aliens and he says, yeah, n not much happened during the term of the Florida presidency. And, you know, he's referring to the whole recount in Florida and all that kind of stuff and talking about how, you know, he, this is looking forward, just projecting out into the future. Oh, yeah, nothing happened. And of course, the story was written before September 11th, 2001. Before, you know, there was an Iraq invasion and all the more momentous things that happened. He's just like, oh, yeah, it was just no big deal. Except for the aliens that came. That's what people think about. I'd heard it after all those things had happened. And I just thought, huh, that's a funny phrase to hear now that uh, we're past September 11th. And uh, things have changed significantly. But yeah, I mean, that's one of those things that happens when you write something and then years pass, you can't <laughs> can't guess what's going to to happen. Yeah, I mean, the whole world building thing that he's done here, and it seems to have an internal consistency too, and uh, its own rules and logic. And it's just, I couldn't write that kind of science fiction. You sort of 
derided your own talents there saying, you know, it'd just be <laughs> people like you destroying TIE fighters. But yeah, I think if I, you know, my, <laughs> my science fiction is future version of now or a version of now where there's interstellar travel or time travel or, you know, it's just, there are different kinds. And, and, and if I was to write, surely there is a name for what this subset of science fiction is. Uh huh. It probably has punk on the end of it too. Oh yeah, it's like biopunk or something like that. Yeah, but uh, I, I I would not be able to write something like this. Uh, yeah. But hey, who cares? Because we've got Jason Sanford to do it for yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I don't know when he wrote this story and how far back it goes, where the idea came from, but I feel like the world now is really kind of similar to this world. But in a, a little bit of a different way, you know, they talk about the people basically like living their lives online and digitally. And if, if you go back far enough before they had iPhones, that might have been, you know, a far fetched kind of a future. But these days, it would almost take being a monk to get somebody sometimes to get their face out of their phones these days, you know. Those things are so attached to our hands that I'm surprised that nobody's had them actually attached to their hand yet. Um, I guess because it'll wear out. Maybe you can have a skin sleeve made in your arm that you can just slip a new phone into. <laughs> well, surely there will be people who have, what do you call that, where somebody's got a Wi-Fi a hub or something like that where other people can get Wi-Fi from it? A uh, hotspot? Uh, yes, there you go. I, I don't think we're far from people getting hotspots implanted in their bodies. So anywhere they go, they provide wireless. Mm -hmm. I used to work with this woman who has now... I think she left the biz and became a mommy blogger the fuck <laughs> and just out of the blue i saw her on facebook the other day and she linked to her mommy blog page and so i went and checked it out and um, she realized basically that social media had taken over her life and was sort of ruining it and so she unhooked herself. She, I think she became a monk. She <laughs> and didn't get on Facebook or Twitter or any of those things for a while just to force herself to live her life. You know what I mean? To actually look up and see things sometimes. Because you get in those habits, you know what I mean? Like you, you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, I should see if somebody responded to my stuff on Facebook. And so you check your Facebook and Facebook... Uh, that was one of the things in her blog that she she linked to an article that BBC or PBS or somebody like that did a whole podcast about just the things that they do. They have like, you know, scientists that are basically paid to hack your brain and figure out just what it is that they need to do to keep you on their apps, to keep you there longer and longer and longer. So they do different things. Like, I don't know if you've noticed this. Um, this is a relatively new thing that they have on Facebook. Say you put a post on there, right? And then you go drive to work or something like that. And then you get to work and you look and like, say 10 people have liked your post since you uh, posted it last. And you go in there and you click on it. And then this little thing happens where like a bunch of thumbs up like symbols pop out of the out of the post like confetti. Have you seen that? That's totally one of those things that they do. It's like it's like uh, when you go to gamble and you know you're on the the slot machine and then when you win and you get the thing it all comes with ching 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 and the bells and the lights flash and all that kind of stuff the, the kind of thing that gets people addicted to gambling the same stuff they do on facebook just to get you oh yeah look at all these people who liked my post i gotta do another one 
it's kind of insidious, really, because there's a lot to life aside from what's on Facebook, etc., and the other ones, the Instagrams and the Snapchats and the Twitters. And I'm using the plural thing just to be annoying because I hate it when people do that. Yeah, I mean, they're all out there and they're all doing those things to try and get you to come back and to stay longer. And you get, you get a kind of a twitch sometimes. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but this is a thing that they've actually documented, like, scientifically. You can take a phone away from a millennial, for example. They'll... But you can't take the millennial away from the phone. <laughs> and they'll be sitting there in the room and they'll feel phantom vibrations in their pocket. They'll be sitting there and then they'll, they'll feel like their phone is vibrating. They'll be like, oh, I got to Oh, wait a minute. My phone's not there. They took it away from me. Something is telling me to kill. <laughs> is mommy I will kill? Yeah, basically that it's that ingrained. It's actually to the point where they feel their phone vibrating even when they don't have the thing. I mean, I guess that that's really similar to this story, just the people living online and the guy having to become a monk and live in the freaking uh, hills by himself to let go of the neural net. I suppose he probably can't really participate in society very well without it. I mean, most of those people, they said, had like jobs online. Virtual jobs. Yeah, yeah. They, were, they were working like on the other side of the planet doing something completely different in their virtual job. They were like <laughs> that kid on a uh, hot tub time machine where he's playing Sims and his character has been thrown in jail and he has to live the jail sentence out in real time. And so he logs onto the Sims and just sits in prison all day long. Sorry, I, I, don't, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, <laughs> any excuse to hate millennials... You... I just, I appreciate you giving me that. But yeah, um, so that's just one of those things I've been thinking a lot about right now. My kids, my whole family is pretty uh, linked in, if you'll pardon the pun. Well, yeah, you were they, telling uh, me the other day, um, you were bewailing the fact that you never see your wife. Eva. 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 You said, Eva. But, the, Eva. but when I do see her, she's got her face buried in the phone. It's more interesting to her. Than spending time with you, even though she constantly recognizes that you can't spend time together. Yeah, and my kids are the same way. I mean, we've moved to a different town, but I don't know that they would know the difference, really. It's just a, a different colored walls on the room that they spend all day in looking at their phone. My son still plays online video games with his friends, the same that he did before. He's still playing with them, same friends. He hasn't made new friends because he doesn't need to. He just plays with the old friends online. And uh, the only difference is they don't, uh, every now and then after playing a video game, they would like go and go to Taco Bell or something afterwards and get some food together. So they would actually see each other IRL. Don't do that. But uh, yeah, now that's the only difference. They don't do that. And I don't know what to do about it. You know what I mean? Like, unfortunately my son, He's the one that knows. Uh, I mean, he set up our Wi-Fi that we have here now. Uh, I saw a thing once on Facebook where somebody posted a picture of the note that they leave for their kids each day where it says, like, uh, if you want today's Wi-Fi password, here are the chores you must do. And there's a list of chores. You know, they can't uh, get the password until they've done those things. And then they come and ask for it. And the guy changes the password every day and gives them new chores. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's genius. If only I had any idea how to change the password on my Wi-Fi. <laughs> my son does, and my son, I'm sure, if I changed it, would just... He would go around I mean, it, yeah. Yeah, he would just fix it. He would, like one time, he was failing his class in school, and he, but he was staying up late and playing with his friends on video games and not doing his homework, and I'm like, dude, if you still have an F, tomorrow I am taking away your the cord to your computer. So I took the cord to his computer. He had a backup. He had another one that he just plugged it in with <laughs> right back to it. I was just like, holy crap. Ugh. But yeah, that's just one of those things. I would like to do something like that, but I really don't know what to do. I guess I could just unplug the router and just 
take it, physically take it. But then you can't use it. True. Although maybe you're doing yourself a favor. I don't know. I know. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the idea. I mean, I'm home in the morning and so are my kids, but it doesn't feel like it. It feels like I'm the only one home. It's me and the five-year-old. He's not into the Wi-Fi so much just yet. Give him a year. But yeah, all the rest of them, they're all home, but they never come come out. They're all like pale, like vampires, because they've never seen the sun. Which, I mean, I can kind of understand, because if you go outside here, you immediately catch fire. Start burning, so... Probably better that they don't see the sun. Uh, maybe they are vampires, then. <laughs> No, that's just the way it is in Houston. It's really hot, man. <laughs> the The difference between the heat inside and the cool outside is enough, plus you add the humidity in, that you walk outside and the you're cold enough that water condenses on you. You, you don't sweat. It just, it just condenses out of the air. You have condensation just forms on your body because you were cold and you walked into the heat. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know how to respond to that. I, I, I've got nothing. 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 If I don't have you. Oh, okay. Wow, you took that well. <laughs> we all love Whitney. Uh, do you have time to play a game with me? I can do that. You got a game? I do. It's a time to play everybody's... <laughs> Second to least favorite game show, Jason Sanford or Trash Canford. And basically, <laughs> okay, those of you in the studio audience, you already know how to play. But those of you just tuning in, maybe you don't know the rules. The thing is, Jason Sanford is a very talented writer, but his stories tend to have very strange titles, very obtuse titles. Have you found this to be the case, Big Anklevich? Yeah, his stories tend to have kind of ethereal titles. I mean, I, I, I could barely get the title to, the, to today's story out. What was the title to today's story? We eat the hearts uh, uh, that come for you, right? There, that, that is correct. Bing, that is correct. That was just a practice, I'll that one. I keep wanting to add in of those that come for you, but there is no of those. Oh. So I have here in front of me a list of titles, and you have to identify whether it is actually a Jason Sanford title or not. Okay. I might have a, a, a little a bit of an advantage since he's been a, you know, appeared on our show many times. Okay. We will see. Hopefully this will work in my favor. All right, so first, may our voices sing like blood from open wounds. Sounds like a Jason Sanford story title. You just have to say yes or no, sir. I just have to hit the buzzer and go, okay. Bzz, uh, I'm gonna say yes. Bing, that is correct. Yes. That is the name of a Jason Sanford story. Number two, Blood Grains Speak Through Memories. That sounds like it should be the sequel to When Thorns Are the Tips of Trees. I'm gonna say no. Oh, I'm sorry, that is oh, a Jason Sanford story. Dang it. Uh, one that appeared on Beneath Ceaseless Skies. Oh. Uh, number three, Banana daiquiris go bad if you don't drink them right away. <laughs> that should be a Jason Sanford story, but I'm going to guess that it's not. Ah, uh, correct. Uh, number four, Death Flowers of Never Forgotten Love. Wow. It is a very obtuse title. Let's say that that is a real story by Jason Sanford. That is correct. Yes! I've forgotten, I've lost count, but number five, I'm going to say. The terror of knowing what this world is about. Watching a good friend scream, let me out. <laughs> the, 
that is actually by uh, Queen and David Bowie. Um, so no. Okay. But that's, that's a good, that would be a good title. Okay, number six. What is sand but earth purified? Ooh, this one I actually know is a Jason Sanford story. Oh, all right. Is this? Is it this? is, yes. Okay, uh, number, I think we're on number seven. The sun obscured by clouds on a beach with the girl you love, just like needing to run to Walmart to pick up some corn chips, only to find out it's one of those Walmarts that's not open 24 hours and has already closed. <laughs> I've gone to many of those Walmarts in my days. I think we went to many of them together even. Uh, therefore, I think that's probably a Rish Outfield story and not a Jason Sanford story. Ah, well, it's a sad story. Nevertheless, <laughs> uh, number eight, the ever dreaming verdict of plagues. Hmm, I think I've heard of that story. In fact, I think I voiced that story. So I'm going to say Jason Sanford. Ah, yes, correct. Into the depths of illuminated seas. Hmm, that sounds familiar. I'm going to say that's Jason Sanford, too. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I had links to the actual stories on most of these, and I just wanted to make sure. Yes, that one was from Interzone. Okay. <laughs> January 2010. Okay, uh, I, I'm going to say that that was number eight, and this is number nine. Is that fair? Sure. Gunt. That's the guy who can't say the letter C, so he's replaced it with the letter G, right? You know what I want. <laughs> I'm going to say no, that it's not Jason Sanford. Uh, sadly, no. I, I, and, I, and the world is lesser for it. <laughs> Number 10. Here we are, falling through shadows. Ooh, you know, I think I've actually read that story. That one is Jason Sanford. Ah, uh, damn it. Uh, Number 11. Little Angel Helper. <laughs> that one is actually a uh, <laughs> Bria Burton story, if I remember right. <laughs> you get no extra points for identifying who actually wrote it. Darn. <laughs> Just no would have sufficed. Uh, number 12, when thorns are the tips of trees. Oh, that's a classic Jason Sanford story if ever I heard one. Oh, yeah. Was that 12? Sure. We don't know anymore, do we? Number 13, no. candlesticks like cacti after a particularly brutal winter. <laughs> it's close, but I'm going to say no cigar. No, no, no Sanford on that. That is correct. That is a uh, Marshall Latham story there. Oh, it is okay. the Marshall Latham story. Uh, you told me I get no extra points for knowing that, so I didn't bother. No, neither <laughs> does Marshall. All right. Uh, number I don't know, 27. The ships like clouds risen by their rain. You know, that's another one I've actually read. Uh, that is Jason Sanford. Indeed it is. Number uh, 81. What is love, baby, don't hurt me? Don't hurt me no more. <laughs> what has love got to do with it? Got to do, got to do with it. I don't know who that is. I can't claim extra points on that. It was one of those early 90s bands that did the dance music, not Jason Sanford. Ah, uh, well. That, I mean, so the weird thing is, you haven't read his Wikipedia, that actually was Jason Sanford, oh. lead singer of Hadaway. Ah, uh -huh. oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, number 16, enucleation means to remove an eye. Uh, I'm gonna say no. Can the judge's ruling on that? Just a second. <laughs> you click on the link? Well, I was just like, I don't know the word enucleation, so I know I, I didn't write that. But it's not coming up as a Jason Sanford story. Enucleation means losing an eye? What was it? Actually, that is a Jason Sanford story published in Southern Gothic Online 2002. Ah. We're almost done, kids. You can go home soon. 
Kleinfelter syndrome means a man develops lactating breasts. <laughs> That's a Rich Outfield story, I believe. Indeed it is. <laughs> Pretty good. One more expert speaks to jury. You know, that doesn't sound like the normal kind of a Jason Sanford title, but I'd still like to say that it is. I'm going to say yes. You are correct, sir. Oh, yes. And last, the last Jason Sanford or Trash Canford for aging kids who dream of Star Treks. Hmm. Star Treks. Did you call it Star Trek when you were little for a while? No. Oh, I'm pretty sure I did. I'm going to say yes, Jason Sanford. Yes, originally published in Tales of the Unanticipated. So there you go. You have won the game. You get a copy of our home game. You get a box of, ooh, partially eaten rice a and you get a barium enema Yay. Uh, at the location that you choose. So what? congratulations. Please join us again tomorrow for... Oh, we've been canceled. <laughs> oh, the cat's eating it. I do want to thank Jason Sanford, despite his titles, for being so generous with his stories for us. I mean, at this point, I would even run Enucleation means to remove an eye. You know? Yeah, just, uh, I'm actually intrigued by that title. That's yeah, cool. well, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's entertaining and educational. Yeah. I'd like to see exactly how that fits into the story. But uh, I'd like to thank Jason as well for uh, always being willing to, to toss a story our way. They're always good. You know what I mean? They're never, it's never like, oh yeah, we just gave him the crumbs off of the table. They're always, every one of his stories are top notch. So it's always a pleasure to be able to include one of his stories on our show. Yeah, did you know he wrote a song called Peacemaker, Peacemaker, Little Bo Peep? I did know about that story. Oh, okay. I believe we had uh, somebody go, Peace, on that story over and over again. <laughs> we haven't done this in a long, long time. Yeah, it has been a while. Not, not exactly like riding a bike. <laughs> yeah, we need to uh, do it more often so that we can... Keep up our muscles. Yeah, your your glutes could use some work, sir. Oh, that's the truth. All I'm developing is table muscle these days. Do I want to know what table muscle is? Oh, that's just what you jokingly call your beer belly. Your huge gut. It's table muscle because you developed it by sitting at the table and eating. Ah, well, that's one more muscle than I've got. <laughs> but, yeah, I think we've come to the end of this episode... Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, John Boy. Thank you, Grandma. Thank you, Building and Loan. Yeah, the old movie house. Ah. And a happy new year to you. In, in jail. jail. All right, folks. I guess we'll be back again with another episode, hopefully sooner than later. And um, we'll see you again then. Okay, and thank you, Big Anklevich. Thank you, Rochelle Field. Good night. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Good night, John Boy. Believe me, we know that from experience. Take two. The mountain curved like a natural amphitheater as it rose above the village of Antalee. What do you think? Antalee? Annalee? Uh, well, let's pr pronounce the T, but I like uh, stressing the, the first A. Antalee? Uh-huh. Okay. What do you like? I mean, you said Antalee. Right, because that's just what came to mind but i thought maybe we But do you to like that better it. than Antilly? No. Antilly, Antilly. The mountain curved like a natural amphitheater as it rose. That sounded lame.
The mountain curved like a natural amphitheater as it rose above the village of Antali. That's not how we were going to do it. The mountain curved like a natural amphitheater as it rose above the village of Antali. <laughs> Did that sound really unnatural? No, it's fine. Like I paused or something before it? Okay. The cyber uploading cries and moans of amorous couples severely tempted his solitary vows. He really wanted to cyber upload it, if you know what I'm saying. He was going to e shunt it. Oh, don't say e shunt. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> oh, I did so much bleeping in that uh, episode I dropboxed today because there were times when I was just like, Big, get off your friggin' fat, disgusting butt and write friggin' something, write friggin' now. And so I bleeped like even butt. So it just sounded like a stream of profanities. And then at the end I say, you couldn't. And you don't bleep that? I, I did bleep that too. But uh... Brother Merrill gasped, struggling to turn off his connection. Let me gasp, trying to think of how to do his voice. Oh! That was an awesome gasp, by the way. Your contribution has been really top-notch so far. <laughs> I, I predict it's going to be a good night. I got a feeling. That's right. With a pained scream, Brother Merrill reached behind his neck and manually turned off his connection. Pained scream, go. <laughs> dooly doot, dooly doot. Everyone in the village felt the hacking's after effects. See, that sounds like a robot. It <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, to be way more human that's not it. me doing it for real. I was just messing around. Why? Elijah's life mate, a prominent sub vocalist named Keela. Yeah? Yeah, you're narrating. You get to decide. Oh, wow. I'm filled with power and excitement I think I have an erection no 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 unfortunately no I don't and you never shall again <laughs> a soft voice said you say it and then I'll say it uh, as the part of the sentence okay a soft voice said hush hush I know you do, but there's only one way to prove it. And it's with anal. <laughs> Keela looked to Brother <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Did you just get shorter? <laughs> this stupid chair is not attached on one side, so you hook it on there and it works, but sometimes it comes unhooked. He tended to Keela and his kids. Prepared Elijah's food, food, which she couldn't eat because she was dead. Yeah, I thought that Renee would be great for this character because she's got such an innocent voice, you know, young, mm -hmm. and sort of all the more terrible. <laughs> but instead, it's you now. Yeah, well. The Hara. Do you know anybody that would say Hara? It's horrible. I do. It's, sorry, horror. That's oh. horrible. Why do you look like Kendra? My neural connection is off, so I know you're not Huck. Now he's become Doc Brown. Has he been Doc Brown the whole time? My neural connection is off, so I know you're not hacking me, Marty. And that didn't even account for the pain the men had craft. Damn it, I almost had it. And that didn't even account for the pain the man had crafted into this construct's life through her per first programming. Sure. You falling asleep? Or is it just hurting your eyes? It's just my eyes are... The goggles. Yeah, they, they do nothing. They do nothing. As for the hundredth time, he nearly forgot this wasn't his long-dead friend, but instead a simulacrum. Simulacrum or lacrum? Oh. Simulacrum or simulacrum? I would have said simulacrum, but when you say simulacrum, that doesn't sound wrong either. Mm -hmm. Double check it real fast. Dictionary.com. You teach me jack squat. Paranymph. 
Ew. Dictionary.com has gotten so much better since the days you and I used to first use it. Yeah. Uh, there's almost never a word where it doesn't have a pronunciation. Yeah. But in those days of the early Dune Steve, you're like, great. Okay. It doesn't <laughs> know. Come on. Weird. What was all that? Simulacrum. Simulacrum it is. A few, le- a few leaks later. <coughs> Brother Mara woke. <laughs> oh. Brother Mara woke hard. He had morning wood. Someone is farting. Oh, it's the cat. It's the cat outside or something. And have you ever put and the end of one of your stories like the we sometimes would see on submissions? Where it just says end instead of the end? Yeah. No. Why would anybody do that? Remember we would always say it as like rudely and uglily <laughs> as possible. Because it is, it's just and, and. It's like an angry Hispanic midget saying okay. and. I hadn't thought of it that way, but I guess you're right. It is like an angry Hispanic midget. I just think it's like a broken computer. And. And.